So uh, here at CES with Sierra Space, uh, can you talk about yourself, what you do with the company? Sure, my name is Ken Shields. I'm the Director of Commercial Market Development within our business development uh, group here at, at Sierra Space. And uh, my focus, my team's focus is on uh, shaping new markets, uh, exploring new markets, uh, primarily commercial markets, uh, looking at advanced research, uh, new areas of science, uh, and technology advancement, and, and hopefully with a, with a slant towards benefiting and improving life on Earth some way, somehow. Awesome, and your, of course your biggest product here, especially at CES, is the biggest one here is Dream Chaser. Can you tell us about Dream Chaser, what it's going to be doing, and, and what's the first step? Yeah, the like? Dream Chaser space plane. I, I think we're probably the only booth at CES that has a space plane in it. So, I think so too, yeah. that's an awesome differentiator for us. I'm glad you guys came by to see. So the Dream Chaser space plane, uh, scheduled to fly, first of all, scheduled to fly its first mission in January of uh, 23, so about one year from now. Uh, we've got seven missions scheduled to the International Space Station. We're going to resupply the ISS with cargo and supplies and research payloads. Uh, once again, a big differentiator for the Dream Chaser space plane, return cargo. So it'll be joining uh, SpaceX as one of the vehicles that can return cargo from the ISS to the ground. A uh, big differentiator, once again, for the Dream Chaser, soft landing. She comes in like a glider. Uh, we also have the ability to land this spacecraft pretty much anywhere in the globe, uh, which is quite nice. We, we hope to develop a, a nice large pipeline of customers, both commercial and, and government from around the, the, the entire planet. Uh, we also have a, a version of the Dream Chaser that will accommodate crew. So we intend to fly passengers on the, on the Dream Chaser in the coming years as well. So the, the DC-100, that would be the initial cargo version. The 200 is the crew. and. What about a 300 version? We've seen some on some NASA presentations. If you, is there anything you were able to elaborate there? I can't talk uh, too much about the 300 version. Um, there's, there are still a, a number of emerging requirements and mission objectives that would be associated with the 300. And, and by the way, we think that there will be iterations of the Dream Chaser beyond that. Um, our vision here is to have a fleet of, of Dream Chaser space planes uh, serving all types of missions and, and requirements, uh, both commercial, private sector, industry, and government related type stuff, yeah. Now, you may not be able to share any numbers. When you say a fleet, are you thinking like 10? Are you thinking like 50? Like, do you have any? 10's a good round number. 10's <laughs> a good round number initially. Okay. I think that's kind of one of our one of our goals, one of our visions, but we have the ability to evolve and, and uh, respond to what the customer and client demands will be over time as well. So speaking of uh, customer and client, obviously you have uh, NASA with the resupply missions. Um, looking forward towards uh, the, the crude version especially, who do you anticipate being potential customers beyond government? Well, you mentioned NASA. There are other governments uh, around the, the globe that we fully anticipate will be customers that will buy seats and space on the Dream Chaser. But beyond that, we think it's a great opportunity for uh, researchers, uh, scientists and technologies that maybe re represent industry consortium from around the countries. Uh, as an example, uh, tourism, you know, certainly we're going to dive very heavily into servicing the tourism market and, and coming up with a whole new slate, a whole new menu of space flight experiences uh, for tourists to, to be a part of. Um, also, uh, private uh, industry, you know, we can see where uh, large industry might want to have researchers and technologies in space on a platform in microgravity where they have the ability to make some observations in situ in space and make real time uh, iter iterations uh, on their experiments and run them. But what we've lacked uh, up, up to now in, in our space flight experience is the real experts in a, in a specific field to be able to make those observations real time and work on their bench top in space like they might work on their bench top on the ground. And so we think that there's great potential for that. And certainly the Dream Chaser will be a big part of that, along with some other assets that Sierra Space is, is developing right now. So speaking of those other assets, you have the uh, mock-up of the Life Habitat. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, the Life Habitat's awesome. Uh, so Life Habitat, it's essentially a three-story building uh, that will be in space. So we like to challenge people to uh, come up with ideas, challenge us on, on what you need in the way of technologies and capabilities to have an address in space where you can make movies, do research, advance your technologies. Um, you know, the, the, really the ideas are infinite as to what we can do in space. Uh, a little bit about the life habitat, as I said, it's essentially a, a three-story uh, building, if you will. It's a little under 300 uh, cubic meters of, of pressurized internal 
uh, volume. Uh, it's based on an expandable or an inflatable technology, so we can get that allows us to get this uh, potentially very large volume uh, on a low mass uh, to low Earth orbit to LEO. Uh, this mock-up has gardens, it has workstations, it has sleep stations. Uh, with the with the appropriate ECLIS systems, we can house about 10 people in a life habitat. To give you a sense of what 300 cubic meters is, roughly, it's about one third the size of the current ISS as far as internal volumes, International Space Station. Uh, the life habitat, um, it, it will be a, a, a major component, a, a, a major element of the Orbital Reef Space Station, uh, which we are planning to have its initial operating uh, capability on orbit in the 2026 timeframe, certainly early 2027. It'll be the largest element of the, uh, of the Orbital Reef. Uh, but what's important about the Orbital Reef, all of the technologies, the subsystems, everything that, that the life uh, is built upon can also live on service habitats, so we could see life habitats living on the surface of the moon, uh, surface of the Mars, and in any orbit that, that you can think of. So a lot of application leverage with this vehicle. Looking towards the orbital reef, can you, uh, is there anything more you can provide timeline-wise? If you think like when it first becomes operational, are you, is that looking at like one life habitat and like? Sure, uh, so, so orbital reef, uh, our vision in partnership with Blue Origin on orbital reef it really is a multi-use business park. Um, we'll need to adapt Orbital Reef to have the ability to transition a lot of the activities that we have on the ISS right now, the International Space Station, for NASA and for the partners and for industry that are there now. So that's sort of some of the initial requir requirements that we're considering and capabilities that we'll need to have. But we're also looking to the future, to the next generation of capabilities and technologies to support what we want to do for the next decade in space. So the initial uh, stand-up um, uh, capabilities or, or configuration of the orbital reef will be the core section, which will provide most of the power, the ECLIS systems, uh, navigation, avionics, it's essentially uh, the power module, if you will. It will have some research capabilities, it'll have some uh, tourism capabilities, but it'll, it'll sort of be the, the guts of the system, so to speak. Then the life habitat will be the largest single element. Uh, once again, about 300 cubic meters. Um, we talked about it, right? The other component that Sierra Space will be bringing to the reef platform is the node, as we call it. So the node will house two berthing uh, ports, uh, also an airlock uh, that we are planning to have uh, EVA capability, which is essentially egress and ingress in, inside and outside for going out and doing spacewalks. Um, the, the initial uh, configuration will also house a mast and a uh, solar array that provides power to the systems. So you mentioned the EVA. I know that some people are looking forward to the possibility of like a tourist EVA on the ISS. So is that uh, thought about as a possibility. Absolutely. I, I, I think it's a must, but I'm a business development guy, right? <laughs> okay. uh, so yeah, I, I think EVA is is sort of the next thing with the space tourism. Uh, and I think it's something we're going to look at real hard. I know we're looking at it right now. Uh, and I think it's a real possibility. I think EVA will be a thing. Awesome. Um, I just want to pivot back to Dream Chaser shortly. Can you uh, talk about some of the differences between the cargo and the crew version of Dream Chaser? I know we've seen that uh, potentially the cargo could serve as like an emergency vehicle. Like, it, it, it's a possibility. I mean, that would take uh, a whole different iteration of the Dream Chaser to have both capabilities. I'll, I'll say it like that, but certainly makes sense, right? Um, the cargo version uh, can deliver roughly about 5,500 kilograms of cargo to the ISS. Can return about 1,500 kilograms to the ground. Once again, soft landing, so very quick early payload retrieval. Um, I mentioned before, can land pretty much anywhere that, that we can have an appropriate landing facility. Uh, the Crew Dream Chaser, right now, we've got a version that can accommodate up to 10. Uh, that's roughly, I think, about 6,000 kilograms in total and, and return that same number. So uh, its ability to serve as a lifeboat, so to speak, for, for Orbital Reef and for other platforms potentially in station will be huge. Uh, we also uh, envision Dream Chaser potentially as a vital sort of logistics module, if you will, provide some real important infrastructure for things like satellite servicing, uh, satellite refueling, uh, maybe even satellite capture and controlled deorbiting. I think it could play a role in those uh, um, 
applications in space. And with landing, you the, the space shuttle had, of course, a primary and a backup location, um, and, and that's also several contingency locations across the globe. Do you have stuff like that? Do you have you have a list off? You know, like where you primary want to land at? Is it a backup on the West Coast, East Coast? Yeah, right now our operations we're launching from Kennedy Space Center, uh, right there at Kennedy at Cape Canaveral, Florida. That's also our primary uh, return landing facility there, and we will have. Uh, Sierra Space facilities there for recovery and, and reprocessing of the facility getting ready for its next mission. We also have agreements in place with uh, Huntsville, Alabama, for ex uh, example. We've got an agreement there with the Chamber of Commerce and, and some other companies there to have a landing facility in operation there potentially. Uh, we're in talks with other countries uh, for the same, same sort of application. So we're actively pursuing other strategic partnerships where we can in fact return uh, the Dream Chaser uh, for, for for missions outside of the U.S. So you mentioned uh, the processing facilities at Kennedy. As as someone down there all the time, I'm like looking forward to more. Is there anything else we can expect facility-wise down there? Or? Yeah, certainly. We uh, Earlier this year, I believe, we had a press conference. We did. We had a press conference with Space Florida down there uh, where we announced this partnership to use the old shuttle landing facility. That's where the Dream Chaser will land. Uh, our full anticipation is we will stand up a pretty significant facility there, employ hundreds of people uh, to house that, to house the facility and, and conduct those operations. It will be fully private, fully commercial endeavor that Sierra Space will be uh, pursuing there. Yeah. Greg had mentioned yesterday about uh, manufacturing on uh, Orbital Reef. What sort of stuff can we see there? So uh, uh, some of the thrust areas we're getting into, some of the market sectors we'll be uh, concentrating on will be in space manufacturing. Uh, things like initially probably research in things like exotic glass, uh, new fibers, optical fibers. Uh, we're going to be working with different companies in academia, understanding, for instance, the process of uh, thin, thin layer, thin film deposition processes that might, as an example, and this is some real projects going on today, uh, artificial retina uh, production in space right now. That's, that's some work that's occurring right now. We'd like to continue that work, port it over to the orbital reef and the life habitat where we can produce things at scale, uh, not just sort of the test kitchen or the proof of concept that, that's existing right now in space. Beyond that, we're going to be working with biopharma uh, for uh, using microgravity to do disease modeling to advance things in drug development and drug formulations, uh, particularly in the area of regenerative medicine, treating things like osteoporosis, things that uh, affect the entire planet, huge populations. Um, but in space assembly and in space manufacturing and being able to now actually transition from proof of concept and test kitchen to full scale production of something in space, we have the ability to go and do that now with things like the life habitat. So that's, that's the plan for us to work very, very hard to prospect for those things and to shape and develop those new market opportunities. And, you know, you hear a CES, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show, yeah. you know, very, it's, you're, you're, you stand out here very differently than everyone else. And everyone we've been talking to, you know, kind of like talking about what's the future of your product, what's the future of your industry. Yeah. And space, I've been, I've been giving people the time of like five years. You know, space runs a little bit slower, so maybe about 10 years, something like that. But like, uh, you know, it's been speeding up. You know, what are you looking forward to in the industry, your company as well, you know, what you, what's kind of your, your, your hopes and dreams? Well, CES 22, uh, it's, it's, you just described why we're here, right? The, the world is here with all sorts of technologies and they're looking in five and 10 year increments, right? We think that space and we think the environment of microgravity offers um, limitless opportunities for a number of companies, whether you are um, trying to build new super alloys that will stand high environments, high temperatures to build a better engine block, you know, John Deere tractor maybe. Uh, you are trying to develop the next generation exotic glass to go into every cell phone and every iPad and every laptop there is. Maybe doing that through microgravity research is what opens that up. We're here to introduce and enable access to the world to space like has never been there before. We're also here to learn from the world what are the ideas that we're not thinking of, right? What are the ideas that, that you need? And you don't have to figure out how to get to space. You don't have to figure out how to operate in space. Just tell us what you're trying to get out of it. What are you trying to get out of that microgravity environment? What are you trying to get out of exposing uh, your, your, 
your materials or your science or your technology to the extreme environments. We'll take care of the rocket science and the engineering. We'll bring you back your data, we'll bring you back your products. That's what we're trying to accomplish.